All right, Mark, I'm going to have to let you introduce yourself. I'm sorry because I can't minimize the Zoom once we've started recording and I don't have the, your bio printed out. I apologize. I'm having to. Oh, that's fine. At home. So anyway, this is our community with Mark Howard. We um, learned about Mark's work um, with the Prison Justice Initiative about a year ago. Um, Sue Blaine, who's a parishioner and also part of our Tithe group, read an article, I think, in the Post about it. And we learned more about your work and we're really excited about it and gave um, a small grant last year, and we're hopeful that you're applying again this year um, for your Prison Justice, Justice Initiative or to your Frederick Douglass project. So we're glad that you are spending time with us today, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, and thank you all at Holy Trinity for the support you've given generously to the Prisons and Justice Initiative. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the programs that we run and the values that we hold, and also a little bit about my nonprofit that I recently created, the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice, which really ties together uh, these values and tries to scale some of the work uh, nationally beyond the DC area. Um, and since we all have Zoom fatigue, I know, uh, and many people can stay more focused and engaged when the pace changes, I just give you a heads up that I plan to occasionally share my screen and I'll also uh, so I'll sh show you some slides and then also intersperse a few short video clips um, that I think will, will bring to life the points that I'll be making. But let me start by saying that I spend most of my waking hours every single day trying to do three things. <clears throat> First is I try to help get people out of prison who don't belong there. And by that, I mean wrongfully convicted people but also people who have transformed and who don't pose a public safety risk. Second, I try to rehabilitate and support people on their journey of personal transformation. And we do that through our Georgetown education programs, uh, both in prison and jail through the scholars program, and then also for returning citizens through the pivot and paralegal programs. And third, more generally, I try to help change the public narrative about incarceration and just about everything that I do or write or talk about. And I try to move from demonization to humanization. So to move from a language that talks about them to a language that talks about us. And I do that primarily now through the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. But I wanna give a little bit of a, of a personal um, backstory. And in that sense, Ashley, maybe it's a good thing that you couldn't pull up my bio um, because this is a relatively new change for me in terms of my own work. I consider it a second career. I was actually hired at Georgetown in 2003, so almost 20 years ago, as a political scientist who specialized in European politics. So I'm a professor of government. And um, I have a deep background in European politics. I'm, I'm half French. My mother's French. I'm a dual citizen. I speak both languages without an accent as a native speaker. I also later lived in Germany and in Russia, and I speak both of those languages as well. And I wrote several books and many articles dealing with that part of the world. And I was firmly ensconced in my career and passionate about the work that I was doing and could very well have just continued in that area. And we never would have met today. But I have a deep personal connection to the issue of criminal justice and prisons that went from at the time being kind of an entertaining story that I would sometimes share at dinner parties to actually becoming the dominant force and mission of my life. And so now I'm gonna start by uh, sharing my screen. And you should not be able to see, uh, this, is, this is my bio page, just for a second, if you wanna note down my email address or my social media um, handles. Um, and this is, this is my latest book, Unusually Cruel, Prisons Punishment and the Real American Exceptionalism, and then the Georgetown Prisons and Justice Initiative and the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. But now the story actually, which is very personal, has to do with <clears throat> the person I call my friend and inspiration, Marty Tankler. Marty and I grew up together on Long Island, uh, Port Jefferson, New York. And uh, we've known each other since we we're three years old. We both went to even preschool together, a preschool called Lovey Dovey, believe it or not. And then went to elementary school, middle school, high school together. But on the first day of our senior year of high school, and we both just turned 17, we're born nine days apart. 
Marty woke up to an absolutely horrific crime scene. Um, this is actually a, an image of it, um, where he found um, both of his parents murdered. He woke up and found them, found his mother uh, in, a, in a horrible state. His father was still clinging to life, but never emerged from a coma and never regained consciousness. And Marty was then taken into an interrogation room for many, many hours and manipulated and tricked and pressured and psychologically tortured and supposedly confessed to the murder of his parents. And by the next by that evening, he was in handcuffs, and by the next summer, he was convicted and sentenced to 50 years to life. And then he went to prison. And uh, there's a long story. Here, here are high school yearbook photos, by the way. And sometimes I show this to my students, and I say, which one of these two do you think would be most likely to be sentenced to uh, you know, spend 50 years in prison? And everyone will bet on this guy right here. Um, but in any case, uh, I was covering the, the case um, at the time for our high school newspaper, which in retrospect deserves a Pulitzer Prize because it's the only newspaper in all of, all of New York, all of the country that actually got the story right, which was that Marty was innocent. Marty didn't kill his parents. Um, it took a long time, but we later found out that it was his father's business partner who hired hitmen who killed his parents and most likely paid off a police detective to frame Marty. Now, I, I, if I had you know, a lot of time, and, and I'm sure some of you are interested, I can get into it a little bit later about the story. It's, it's really um, surreal and, and extraordinary, but Marty spent 17 and a half years in prison. Um, at some point we reconnected uh, about a decade into his sentence and I got very, very invested in his case. And I started helping him with all kinds of, of aspects related to this case. I started meeting with his legal team and then I even made a decision that I would go to law school to help get him out of prison. So I was a tenured full professor at Georgetown and made the decision to become a 1L and uh, dedicate my law studies to helping Marty get exonerated. Now, just before I started, a miracle happened. And on the 19th appeal, his case was overturned and he was exonerated. And then actually it turns out I was in Paris on the day that, that the news came out. I flew right back and I was there on the day he walked out. And this photo here is the two of us on the day, literally an hour earlier, he was still in prison for 17 and a half years he spent there. And here are some of the New York papers, um, had front, front page stories about uh, his exoneration. Now, um, after he was exonerated, after this triumph, many people who knew me thought I would just go back to my work on European politics. You know, my admission accomplished, Marty's out. Uh, now you can go back to your career. But I couldn't. And I continued um, with law school and I actually completely rededicated my professional and personal life to criminal justice and prison reform. And the way I put it is that through Marty's case, my eyes were open to injustice and I couldn't close them again. And so what I wanna do for most of the talk here with you today is focus on some broader problems with the criminal justice system that go beyond wrongful convictions. But let me first close the loop on Marty and tell you what we now do together. So Marty, um, after being released um, in, at the very end of 2007, um, immediately went into college classes, finished his bachelor's degree, which he'd started when he was in prison, then went to law school, but while working as a paralegal, did law school at night and has now become a lawyer as well. We're both members of the New York Bar. We're also now colleagues at Georgetown and we co-teach a class together informally called Making an Exoneree where our students reinvestigate wrongful conviction cases. So I wanna show, it's actually been covered and hopefully you'll get to see this at some point on a screen near you, By it's been covered by a documentary film crew for a documentary called Making Exoneree that actually this is a little bit out of date. It's now I think has over 30 selections and uh, over 12 nominations or, or maybe maybe 12 awards. It's, it's done very well. Um, on the film festival circuit. So we hope that it'll, it'll appear um, on a screen or in a streaming service at some point soon. Um, and what I thought I would do, just to give you a little bit of a sense of it, there's a two minute, what's called a sizzle reel that I'll ask you to watch right now. Please. I'll just sit in jail and fight it forever. They know what they did is wrong. They ignore seven witnesses in the confession. The case is full of corruption. Oops. So I'm just gonna keep fighting. 
that we have so many wrongful convictions because there's a rush to closure above the truth. Innocent until proven guilty should be upheld, but it's not often. The criminal justice system doesn't work like it does on law and order. So many people believe you must be guilty of something. You wouldn't be sitting at a defense table at a trial. Marty himself was wrongfully convicted when we were his seniors in high school. His parents were murdered. He was convicted of murdering his parents. Guilty. And I would tell people, I have a friend who's in prison who's innocent. 6,338 days I was in prison before I was finally released. So when Mark asked me to teach a class at Georgetown to save someone else's life, how could I say no? Our goal for this course is for this to be life-changing. Each team of three or four kids is taking on a case of wrongful conviction. So then the shooter shoots once in the air and then three times at you. Justin Baumgartner's body was recovered right here. I want to know what the hell went down the night of May 3rd, 2008. The holy grail for us would obviously be one of our five getting out. You don't just walk out with blood all over you after murdering three people, just go over to your neighbor and be like, hey, what's up? Nonsense. We know it's an uphill battle. We know it's really hard to get somebody out. Do you not agree that there are wrongful convictions? Oh, there absolutely are wrongful convictions. This isn't one. But we're going to try to show there's a major injustice that took place here. The tape was stopped at least four times. This is evidence contamination. Where's your sketch? Where's your micrograph images? Show me some proof that those marks match. These are lawyers who take oaths to their profession and they cheat, steal, hide evidence. Two people said Valentino Dixon was the shooter, but there's 10 other people who said it was a different person. Even if I was to get my freedom tomorrow, I'm labeled a murderer. You literally feel like you have someone's life in your hands, and at the end of this course, I want to be able to give these people hope. These kids are smart, they're passionate, they have an interest. Good catch with what the phone! Oh, that? Whoa! But this isn't just a class. This isn't just about wrongful convictions. This is about people's lives. So many lawyers have been trying to get people out for years. What are we going to do? We're college kids. You are eligible for release today. So the applause that you heard at the end was from the courtroom shortly before the release of Valentino Dixon, whom you see right here, who had served uh, 27 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And thanks to the work of our students, two of the three who'd worked on the case are here, and Marty and I are with them, uh, were able to find new evidence that led to Valentino Dixon leaving prison. In fact, if you look behind me, you'll see some of his artwork. He's an extraordinary artist, and I have some of his artwork that he drew in a six by eight foot cell in Attica prison, where he spent 27 years wrongfully convicted and would still be there if not for our program and for the work of our students. Um, and then, uh, so lightning struck once, and then this past year, it struck two more times. Uh, we were able to help uh, lead to the exoneration of Eric Riddick, who served 29 and a half years for a crime he didn't commit in Philadelphia. Um, and then also Keith Washington, able to help get his sentence reduced from 45 years to time served, 13 years, and he could come home with his wife and daughter there. And you see Marty, who is present for his exoneration. So um, this program that we started kind of uh, as two friends who had an idea saying, we've been through this experience ourselves, him on the inside, me on the outside. Could we transfer our experience to our students and help get other wrongfully convicted people out? And so far we've gotten three people out who served over 69 years between the three of them. And we have several more that are getting very close where we're optimistic that we're, we might have several more exonerations coming this year. Um, so I wanted to, to give you kind of the full arc of the Marty story, because that's where it began for me. And that's something that's still very active. Um, there's also a, a, um, a series that's in development for a TV show. There's also a podcast that's in development. So uh, there's a lot that's happening around our friendship and our story. But I also wanna go beyond that. And I wanna talk a little bit about um, how my work has gone beyond Marty and beyond wrongful convictions as an issue. And I've, I've become very involved in prison education. And I mean that in two senses. The first is literally bringing education to incarcerated people in prisons. And so here you see some images here. Are, I'm coming in with a group of students and here teaching inside a mixed class that had some incarcerated students and some outside Georgetown students. Um, here you see the end of semester celebration we had at the end of 2019 where our keynote speaker was President Jack DeJoya. Georgetown's president um, and, and many of our inside and outside students, we, as we call them, 
who are uh, part of our scholars program, our Georgetown Prison Scholars Program. Um, and uh, so that's one element of education. Another is that we are educating the general public about prisons. And I like to do that by bringing people inside to see for themselves. And as you can see from this picture, I bring in students regularly. I also bring in outside visitors. And on this particular day, I happen to bring in outside visitors some of you might recognize who has 290 million people who follow her every move on Instagram and other social media platforms, uh, Kim Kardashian. And she was able to um, have an amazing experience and, and shared about it for 20 minutes of her documentary, Kim Kardashian West, The Justice Project, which has really helped to spread our message and, and make our, our work known to a wider audience. But what all of this means is that in addition to my work on wrongful convictions, on actual innocence, I'm also embracing the so-called guilty, which to me is people who've made mistakes, people who I believe deserve the chance to prove that they can change, and people who've earned the right to return to society and become productive and successful citizens. And so in 2014, I started volunteer teaching at a maximum security prison in Maryland. And then in 2018, we launched a Georgetown prison education program at the DC jail, which now has actually been expanded just this past uh, month uh, at a maximum security prison in Maryland, the Patuxent Institution, where we started a Georgetown degree granting program. Yes, degree granting. We have a new bachelor's degree for incarcerated students in the state of Maryland. We had over 300 students from around the state incarcerated in different prisons in Maryland who applied to our program. And we have a first cohort that just began of 25 students. That's a student selectivity rate of, of 7%, which is about half that of the main campus, I should add. Um, and overall, this experience of teaching inside and, and working with incarcerated people has brought me together with the tremendous humanity that's locked away from society, forgotten and abandoned, often for many decades, under conditions that are just unimaginable. And I've learned so much about the utter cruelty and heartlessness that plagues this country in terms of how we treat the less fortunate among us. And it's really made me a, a true believer in the power of prison education, which changes people's lives and makes society safer. There's all kinds of evidence that shows that even as little as one higher education course for people who are incarcerated reduces recidivism by 43%. People who take part in a program such as ours have recidivism that hovers about 0% and certainly zero violent crimes. So the solutions are actually at our fingertips. They're available. If we're able to provide programming, in particular education to incarcerated people, we can reduce crime, reduce costs, reduce recidivism, and make for better and, and safer societies. Now, what I'd like to do uh, for just a few moments is take a step back and give you a sense of the American criminal justice and prison systems. And then I want to focus on what we're trying to do about it with the Prisons and Justice Initiative and with the Frederick Douglass Project. So I have a few slides here. So maybe I'll put my professor hat on for a moment and I use some of these in my undergraduate lecture course, Prisons and Punishment. But I think it's important to have a little bit of a background in terms of what makes this system so unique and what makes it so cruel. And I call it unusually cruel. So first off, the US has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. Right, so that's a staggering disparity just in and of itself. One quarter of the world's incarcerated people are in the United States. We incarcerate at much higher rates than anywhere else in the world. So the darker red is the United States. You know, the country that comes closest is, is Russia. Um, and certainly when you think about advanced industrialized country, advanced democracies, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, Japan, you have the complete opposite. You have the countries that have much lower, among the lowest levels of incarceration. So something is very different in terms of the United States and other sets of countries. Another way of looking at it is just at the set of countries for which there's available data from Europe. You see the US in 1971, 50 years ago, the US was just a little bit higher than European countries. And then you see over time how it just jumped and really skyrocketed in the United States, right? And so this happened 
you know, partly under Nixon, under Carter, under Reagan, Bush, under Clinton. Right? This is both parties. That's the point I'm trying to make. This is not about one side or another. This was a bipartisan push to incarcerate. And other countries in Europe stayed you know, quite low, maybe went up very, very slightly, but very little change. Now, some people may immediately say, oh, well, crime went up in the United States. Crime is what explains higher incarceration. That's completely false. That is disproven by the evidence. So crime rates in the US are actually not higher than they are in European countries. That's for both nonviolent and violent crime. The one difference though is homicides, right? And suicides as well, that's not necessarily a crime, but um, murder at the hands of guns or, or someone losing their life at the hand of a gun, which has to do with, with the um, gun safety situation in the United States, which is dramatically different. But the overall rates of crime are not higher. The, the likelihood of being a victim of crime is not greater in the United States than it is in other countries. Now, here, looking at the United States over time, we see that while population went up you know, slightly, steadily, um, crime actually went down. Start, it was going up, certainly in the 1970s and 80s, and then went down starting in the 90s and continued. And we can talk perhaps after about the so-called rise in crime right now, which I um, have, have a view on that is being overplayed. But um, we see that overall, whether it's property crime or violent crime, um, certainly wasn't increasing, but incarceration was. And so what explains is, is a set of policy choices that were made, not background conditions as an automatic response to crime. There were decisions that were made politically in order to deal with the, a perception of fear, perception of rising crime that was very different from the reality. Um, overall, we've reached a point with American mass incarceration where you have about 2.3 million people who are currently locked up behind bars, roughly 800,000 who are out on parole, another 4 million who are on probation. So you put it all together, 7 million Americans are under some form of correctional control. Overall, 15 million Americans touch the criminal justice system at some point each year. And 20 million have felony convictions on their record, which has just dramatic consequences in terms of their ability to live as a full and equal citizen. Overall, when you count arrest records, when you count misdemeanors, 100 million Americans have some kind of criminal record. Not all of it is something that will necessarily harm them severely, but it's all searchable. It can all be found on Google. It's something that is a, a part of, of people's reality. The costs of, are staggering. Um, $183 billion a year of indirect and direct costs spent on incarceration, right? That is something that for anyone who thinks that uh, government is too big, uh, that you know we need to reduce the size of government, um, corrections is the biggest in most states, the biggest component of state budgets. Um, it also costs more to incarcerate than to educate, right? And so you look at here, a sample of states, how much they spend on incarceration. New York spends almost $70,000 per person who's incarcerated. Yet in terms of K through 12 education, about 20,000 less than that for public college, right? So you think these are, these are policy choices. This wasn't always the case, but there's been a change, a decline in spending on education, a rise in spending on incarceration. And that's taken place in many states. California also has a huge disparity, Maryland as well. Another thing to remember is that when somebody is incarcerated, it's not just that person, it's a family. There's an expression, the family does the time too. And this slide shows that 53% of people in prison are parents. In other words, they have children at home who are lacking a parent with them. And the consequences for those kids are also pretty severe. Um, many of them had the parent who lived with them before and that absence is something will have negative consequences on their education on their life chances. 2.7 million children today have a parent in prison, right? And I just want you to think about that. These are innocent kids who through no fault of their, of their own are born into a situation, yet they're paying a steep price for the mistakes made by their parents. And what I would like to argue is that there's a better way, right? That incarceration is not the way and it certainly is actually setting up future problems and future failure and future incarceration. Um, 
Obviously, uh, the way in which incarceration is distributed is not equal across racial or gender lines. So I'll say from the outset, 93% of incarcerated people are male, only 7% are female. That said, the US has, I believe it's 30% of all incarcerated women are in the US. So it's by no means a small number and it's the fastest rising group in American prisons is women. Um, the racial disparities are very strong within each gender where you have African-American men who are six times more likely than white men and Latino men are over double, almost three times as likely as white men to be incarcerated. For women, the disparity is similar, um, not quite as, as great, but it's um, triple uh, for African-American women than it is for white women. And it's about double Latino women than it is for white women. So we have very strong racial disparities in addition to an overall major gender disparity. Now, people who are incarcerated typically come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, lack of education is, is uh, a strong predictor. Um, obviously, illiteracy that goes hand in hand with education and poverty, right? Most people, regardless of their race, who are incarcerated come from a background that includes poverty. So putting all that together and thinking towards the future, it's important to remember that even if somehow you or others around you or others in our society don't care that much about incarcerated people, at least from a self-interested point of view, they should, which is that 95% of people who are in prison will be coming home. And we all have to ask ourselves, who do we want them to be? Who do we want to be pulling up next to us at the gas station, walking into the, the CVS with us? Who do we want to be living in our communities? Do we want them to be people who have been mistreated, who have been abused, who have been victimized? Or do we want them to be people who have grown, who have acquired education, who have acquired skills, who are ready to contribute to society and pay taxes and, and get jobs and start businesses and hire people, right? I think the answer is obvious, but I think morally our society is not always ready to answer that question. So um, I'm now gonna stop my screen share and come back to you here. And I wanna um, say a few more things. I, I've just threw out a lot of broad national and some international statistics at you, but now I wanna move to human beings. And I wanna tell you how I am through my programs trying to change this terrible reality and system. So in 2016, I founded the Prisons and Justice Initiative at Georgetown. It was initially with a very small amount of seed funding from the Georgetown President's Office. From that, I literally I hired six undergraduate students, paying them $12 an hour. And we created a name and a logo and a website and a mission and started some of our early programs. And from that, we've been able to expand, thanks to generous donors, including Holy Trinity, and some grants that we've received where we've really in a short period of time established ourselves as what I think is the country's leading university-based criminal justice and prison reform organization. I don't think there's any university, frankly, that's doing even half of what we're doing in terms of both work inside and re-entry programs. And then also let's not forget the exonerations that we've helped contribute to. And then in 2020, I founded a new nonprofit organization, the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice, which is a national organization that seeks to bring in ultimately tens of thousands of people a year to meet incarceration, incarcerated people in a prison and connect with them on a deeply human level. And what I'm doing there is really scaling the work I've been doing at Georgetown and in the DC area, where I brought in over a thousand students, hundreds of guest speakers and observers inside of prisons. And they've all called the experience eye-opening and life-changing. And so through these visits and these human connections, I'm committed to breaking down the ignorance and the inhumanity surrounding prisons. So I'd like to give you a sense of the incarcerated people that I care about so deeply, but rather than have me tell you about it in my words, I wanna show you a few short videos, probably actually just one given the time that we have. Uh, so one short video that will bring them to life in a much more powerful way than just having me talk about it. Because ultimately this is about people. This is about our fellow human beings. And so when you hear about or read about incarcerated people, and by the way, please don't use the word inmate or convict or felon. 
These are very stigmatizing, dehumanizing labels. But when you read about incarcerated people, I hope that you won't think of the terrible TV shows like Law and Order and others like that, but instead you'll think about the people that you're about to see, because this is what I think of when I think of the humanity of incarcerated people and their potential to contribute to society. So I'm gonna share my screen again and show you a short video about our uh, prison scholars program. Education has changed the trajectory of my life. It has given me a reason to breathe. It has given me purpose as a human being. In January 2018, the Prisons and Justice Initiative launched a pilot education program at the DC jail. We offered a variety of non-credit courses in the spring 2018 and summer 2018 semesters. In September 2018, thanks to two generous donors, we added two credit-bearing courses per semester. We also have the only co-educational prison education program in the country. This celebration marks the end of a great semester with both credit and non-credit classes as we honor the power of education to transform people's lives, families, and communities. At one point, I, I always thought that I didn't really have a voice. A structure formed itself around my life that I couldn't shape. And it wound me here in prison. A life of crime is is something that a lot of people do when they are ignorant to survive. I entered this jail uh, when I was 16 years old, a self-destructive, traumatized child who I could barely read and write. I returned 26 years later as a Georgetown scholar. become educated and you have the know-how, you have the tools to succeed, a life of crime isn't even an option any, anymore. You know, you see better ways, you, see, you have more opportunities open up to you. My goal is to be a doctor in sociology and to be a professor. I wrote this poem for this event and it's called You Ask Me. You ask me what I've learned in democracy. I've learned that the greatest hypocrisy is that democracy isn't something that we should fight wars and kill for, because democracy is something that we should all strive to live for. Prison is not rehabilitative. Education is. Education is the very element that rehabilitates us. Each semester, we're offering two credit-bearing courses along with six to eight non-credit courses and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. So we want to go further. Our goal is to expand our course offerings, enroll more students in our program, and create a vibrant educational community and culture at the DC Jail. It'll take more outside support to achieve our goal, but I can say that our students are working extremely hard, they're making incredible progress, and they're truly performing at the college level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. For more information and to support the Scholars Program, please visit prisonsandjustice.georgetown.edu. I hope that made you smile as much as it does me. Uh, and I'm happy to update you that two of the three people featured in that video have since come home. Um, they were all juvenile lifers. They were sentenced to prison when they were 16 or 17, sentenced to life. And uh, thanks to a change in the law that is giving a second chance to juvenile lifers, as they're called, um, two of the three have since come home. And actually, one of them, I was just at his house on Sunday. He's the father of a baby girl. He's now an artist. He's selling his artwork. He's doing incredibly well. Um, they're both just extraordinary, and I'm so thrilled that they're a part of my life and that I'm a part of theirs, and that this uh, educational journey was so pivotal for them uh, in preparation for their reentry. Um, so, speaking of reentry, we also have several reentry programs, um, including the Pivot Program, which is a partnership between the Prisons and Justice Initiative and our business school, the McDonough School of Business in Georgetown. And we also partner with the DC government 
um, and the, their Department of Employment Services. And we also, and so that, that's a year long program where people uh, who are formerly incarcerated study at Georgetown, uh, entrepreneurship and business. And they, it's a certificate granting program. And then they, um, for the latter part of the program have internships with employers. And so far we have a, a essentially a 100% employment rate for our uh, graduates. We've graduated now uh, three cohorts of the pivot program. We're on the fourth cohort now. Uh, and they're just wonderful people who are so appreciative of the support for their second chance. Many of them have children of their own. It's it's really had all these positive effects for their families as well to be uh, part of the Georgetown family, as we call them. And then we also just recently graduated our second cohort of the Morca Georgetown Paralegal Program, which is for returning citizens who were, while, while they were incarcerated, were jailhouse lawyers who had specific legal skills and interests. And um, now that they've come home up until this program, it would be impossible for them to get hired because they have a criminal record. And we've been pushing law firms and, and organizations in the DC area to be willing to hire them. And all, of, all nine of the graduates of this cohort that just finished a month ago, a few weeks ago, uh, now have jobs at DC area law firms and, and organizations. So we're really pushing the envelope in a lot of different ways. Um, and so to kind of wrap things up, and I'm sure there are gonna be some questions, I just wanna come back at you uh, at, as the audience members and as, as members of the general public. And I'm often asked, what can we do? And I'll say five things. So one is just to be aware, to have your antennae up. And hopefully this presentation has given you a sense about the key information involving the criminal justice and prison systems. Second, I would say vote for leaders who will push for criminal justice reform. And that is whether they are Democrats or Republicans, whatever your own leaning is. Fortunately, this has become a bipartisan issue and or even a nonpartisan issue. Um, so support, have this be an issue that you look at regardless of your own political party preferences. Third, is hire formerly incarcerated people or support policies that will allow for their hiring. Fourth, visit a prison. Um, now that COVID is over, almost over, uh, connect with us at the Douglas Project. We'll be facilitating prison visits in person at the DC jail starting sometime soon, as soon as it's safe, maybe in the next month or so we hope to begin. Uh, we also have virtual visits with a prison in Colorado. Uh, they're very powerful moving experiences and we encourage you to sign up at douglasproject.org. And then finally support organizations that are doing this work because it really has an impact. It has a demonstrable effect on improving people's lives and improving society. And if, if you'll indulge me, I'll just wanna share one last video um, about, oops, sorry, not that one. I just wanna get it ready. And uh, about the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. And you'll see some of our participants from our program in Colorado, where we have these virtual weekly visits and you'll hear in their words what it means for them. Hi, I'm Mark Howard, the founder and president of the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. As you know, the Douglass Project is a unique nonprofit organization that allows members of free society and incarcerated adults to meet and come to know the humanity in each other. Our visits, which are in person and virtual, inform and transform both inside and outside participants, and they serve as a powerful inspiration for personal and systemic change. Frederick Douglass uh, Project residents are important because they allow people to uh, see our humanity. We have a voice here of ourselves, and people on the outside do care. To this day, the humanity of the incarcerated is perpetually denied in a million ways. One of the best ways that we can confront that problem is by putting ourselves physically there with them, to be present with them. Our fears and our worries and our struggles are a lot of the same ones people from the outside are viewing in their own lives. And I can be that accepting person that says, hey, you are human and I am human and I am human. And, and that's how we're going to connect with this society. That's why the Douglas Project, because what it does is build direct bridges 
right over between ordinary citizens going into prisons and meeting real people. The project's important because it gives us the opportunity to interact with the public, to put ourselves in their shoes and themselves in ours, see things, see things through our eyes. And for myself, just to still be able to connect people in society, sometimes you lose that in hand because you don't get those, those conversations like that. So just still to be able to engage and have a civilized conversation. So that makes me feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> As we enter 2022, we are excited to be planning an expansion of both our core visitation programs and new initiatives, always focused on keeping the humanity of those directly impacted by the criminal legal system at the forefront. And so we hope that you will consider supporting our important work and helping us fulfill our mission by making a tax-deductible contribution today. Thank you for your consideration, and thank you especially for believing in the humanity of each and every person. So there we have it. And I, sorry, I didn't mean for it to have that sort of uh, direct ask, and I'm not suggesting that necessarily of you, but that is part of that's from our annual appeal. And obviously, if you feel so inclined, we certainly would welcome it. But I was really here to, to share uh, the work and my passion for helping support incarcerated people. And I hope that um, you found some of this interesting and perhaps inspiring. And I'm also happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you for, for your taking the time out of your day to listen to the, about this work. Thank you, Mark. That was amazing. So uh, I hope you saw some of the comments to the chat that. Um, oh, I didn't actually. Well, oh, then no, just, like, it was really impressive. And, and this is terrific. <laughs> um, I have one question and then we'll, we'll invite other people. Um, when you talk about criminal justice reform, can you talk a little bit more about what that really looks like? Some of us have been doing just faith over the past year uh, um, on, on racial justice. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think the cohort now that's um, looking at systems and structures has been struck by the fact that we didn't, well, I didn't know, and some of us didn't know that, you know, upon leaving um, after incarceration, you don't get access to SNAP or um, any kind of housing assistance and a lot of just kind of abandoned to society. So I'm just curious, is that part of what a criminal justice reform policy yeah. would look like? Okay. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many elements to it really every single stage from you know the the very beginning you might even just say poverty and then policing and then you know arrests and bail is a huge issue and it's kind of a, i call it the, the criminal justice life cycle where then it you know has to do with the, the court system and you know there are inequalities and injustices at every single step of this process and then of course there's incarceration and then the conditions of confinement which are atrocious and the violence and the fear um and the lack of opportunity to to do anything i mean our program is so rare they're they're you know most people incarcerated have nothing to do um and then the whole process of of going through parole which has changed dramatically and then released but then what you're getting at actually is re-entry and you know that's a tremendous problem and ultimately I think that there's a lot that can be done earlier. So there's this expression that re-entry begins on day one of incarceration. And that's how I think it should be, although sadly it often isn't. But there's so much that could be done for supporting people when they do come home. Because you know, a lot of times there's the sense of blame. People look at recidivism rates, say, oh, they're high, they're high. Well, first off, the statistic is very flawed and it includes the majority of what are so-called acts of recidivism are somebody who has a technical violation of parole or probation, which is typically not for a criminal act. So that's something just to keep in mind. But then even when people do go back to a life of crime, the reason why typically is either addiction or it's poverty that is forcing them or they're perceiving that they have no other choice than to go into a life of crime, which typically will involve drugs. So the, the drugs and the addiction are very closely linked and uh, unfortunately, when, when people come home and they want to go down a different path and they find doors that are closed all over the place, and that includes public housing, that includes you know, uh, support, food, and so on, where uh, employment doors are slammed in front of their you know, faces and so on, over and over, at some point, people have bills to pay. They have to you know, 
if they want to not be homeless, they have to pay rent. If they want to have some um, basic support, they have to um, have means to do so. And um, unfortunately, you know, there's always these costs of these fines, these fees, people are constantly having to pay parole in many states, you have to pay. So think about a choice someone has to make. If you can't pay your parole, you're going back to prison or you roll the dice and you try to sell drugs and then you get caught and you go back to prison and then society will label you a career criminal or repeat offender and so on. And a lot of times people don't want that. And so, you know, we need to do a lot more with addiction because that is, that is at the heart of so many unfortunately, so many uh, criminal acts. Um, but we also need to do a lot to support people for when they come home so that they have alternatives, so that they have other options. And education and other programs while they're incarcerated is one way of doing so. But I think there's also a lot more with programs that could be done to support people when they come home. Great, thank you. Sue, did you have a question? I did, thank you. Um, Mark, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us today oh, and for all of your see. work. Um, so one thing you mentioned was that you had 300 people apply and selected 25. So my question is sort of two parts. Um, what are you looking for? How do you figure out who you're taking? And also uh, in terms of you had a slide that mentioned the high rate of illiteracy. How are you finding and working with students in terms of their level of preparedness for college work? Yeah, no, those are great questions, Sue. Thank you. Um, so for our program, this is our bachelor's program at the Patuxent Institution in Maryland. Obviously, that's a, that's a Georgetown program. It's highly competitive. So we were looking for the most qualified applicants. Um, it's a it's a different pool. It's a different process. They're not taking SATs, although I, even on the outside, I guess they're not taking SATs anymore. Things are changing here too. But um, we have them um, write an essay. They have to um, do a reading analysis. We have them write a cover letter and resume, and then we do interviews. So we had actually about about over fifty who were interviewed, and we picked the twenty five. Um, we could have picked another 25 easily. And the, the goal is it's a 25 a year cohort. That's our model. That's our sort of funding structure and so on is to have it be, it's a five year bachelor's program. And so to get to 125 at steady state after five years. And so, you know, we are looking for those who are just the, the most eager and prepared. You know, a lot of them say, you know, I, I love to read. I'm a, you know, constantly reading and learning and growing. And so those are the types of, of students that we want, those who are really ready. Now, you're, the second part of your question is, is interesting because you're right. And, and I showed that slide earlier that a lot of people are really not prepared for college work. And so what's interesting is that many of the people who wind up being fantastic students were not prepared when they went to prison. Right. And I like to make this point to my Georgetown students. I say, you know, some of the smart, smartest students that I've ever had in my classrooms dropped out of school in eighth grade. And I just kind of let that sit for a minute and they think about it because they're thinking, well, someone dropped out of school in eighth grade is stupid. Well, no, that person may have gone down a different a tragic course that led them to go to prison. But intelligence and education are two different things. Right. They may overlap, but they don't always overlap. And you have some very intelligent people who didn't acquire education, but who can later in life. And so that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to find people who have that potential, but we're also trying to create a positive incentive structure. And we've done that where we've made learning cool. And that actually the director of the DOC who, who recently stepped down um, had said that when we started our program in the DC jail, it was a pilot program. It was an experiment. We said, you know, we'll, we'll evaluate in a week or, you know, in a, in a few weeks and see how it's going. The idea being it could be stopped at any minute. He said, this is a culture change. He said, you know, everybody wants to be in these classes. We actually had people trying to sneak into our classes who weren't in our program. And so, you know, and he said the conversations on the housing units are completely different than they were before. People are having debates, discussions, you know, they're using their words, so to speak. They're, you know, engaging intellectually, it's a complete culture shift. So what's amazing about it is that we have people who say, oh, I, I really wanna be in that program, but you know, I don't have my GED yet. Well, guess what they're doing? They're now working on their high school degree in prison, right? So it's creating these positive ripple effects where people wanna get an education and there are steps that they need to take before they might be competitive for our program, but it's pushing them in that direction. And also prison administrators love the program. It makes it you know, run better because believe me, if, you know, if you're in a, 
if you're in our program, whether it's the degree granting program or the credit bearing program at the DC jail, or even our non-credit program at the DC jail, um, if you're in that, you don't want to lose that privilege. That is the highlight of your day, of your week, that being in that program, having guest speakers, having, you know, just professors coming in, having that type of opportunity to engage, you don't want to lose that. So what does that mean? Well, the next time somebody, you know, uh, whatever, steals your shoes or, or takes a candy bar or, or takes your dessert, you know, things that normally people might have to respond to violently. They're going to say, you know what, let's just let's just work this out differently because there's too much at stake. So it brings violence down. Um, there are just so many positive effects of it. And really, it should be done in every prison in America. But sadly, it hasn't been enough of a priority, although we're trying to help change that. Thank you so much. Sure. Ellen, do you want to ask your questions? Is what you say is when they get out, there's nothing for them. Is there any sort of reentry program or a stipend for them to at least find a place to um, find a place to live temporarily, or or um, for goodness sakes, for food or any sort yeah. of sustenance? There are some programs, and there um, maybe halfway houses, although those could be a mixed bag and can have some violence in them, drugs. Um, but uh, there's there, I mean, the DC government actually does a pretty good job of oh, okay. supporting people. There's an organization, the Mayor's Office on Returning Citizen Affairs. And um, they're dedicated to helping people when they re-enter, get connected with organizations that can support them. They don't themselves have huge resources, but they are a connector to organizations that can support people. Um, there are, um, a variety of different services that, that the DC jail has been trying to do with certain unit, units, housing units with that are really preparing people for their reentry and they go right to an outside equivalent uh, of services when they get out so there can be continuity. There's a lot that can happen. So for example, you know, 20% of people in prison overall have, have mental illness of different kinds. Mm -hmm. And you know, so, some of them are, are treatable, but tragically in this country, for the most part, there's been this break in care. So if somebody's getting medication that supports them, but then they get out of prison, well, they, they don't get a supply. They have to, and, and you know, good luck trying to go to a pharmacy without insurance, you know, to, to try to get medication. So then they they slip up and they you know make a mistake, and so um, or they have you know uh, an episode. And so I think that DC has been doing a pretty good job of trying to find ways to bridge those gaps. Uh, and to prevent, um, you know, even worse outcomes. That said, DC is among the leaders in incarceration. If DC were a state, it would have the highest incarceration rate of any state in the country. So, um, you know, there, it, it's a challenge, um, but I think there's been a lot of resources and efforts to try to support people coming home, um, but there's a lot more. And the number one thing is jobs. I mean, that ultimately is what makes or breaks it for people. Um, typically, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, no, no, please go ahead, Ellen. I was just going to say we've seen some uh, films in Just Bay from a couple of the the uh, cities and about incarceration where they literally at 11 o'clock at night when they're getting out they just kind of push them out the door into a yeah. cab and they're by themselves so yeah. that's why I was asking it's so it's hard unless there's family um, you know but uh, they're more and more trying to make an effort to have a reentry plan where are you going to stay. Um, let's let's meet the person, interview the person. Let's see where you're going to be. Let's make sure it's a good environment. What other support do you need? Um, the problem is our numbers are staggering. You think about it, that 2.3 million, think about it compared to other countries. It's, it's astronomical. And so it's hard for each person to get individual attention like they deserve. What about women versus men in these educational programs that you're doing? Yeah. Well, as, as you saw in one of the videos, we do have women in our classes and we're the only program that's ever been approved in the country to have women. I pushed really hard for it. Again, they said, oh, it'll never work. That you know, The men are gonna be obnoxious and so on. Well, I said, look, if they are, they get kicked out. And guess what? <laughs> no one's gotten kicked out and no oh, one's good. been obnoxious. So they value it. And, um, but you know, it is a challenge because <sighs> overwhelmingly people think of incarceration as just a male problem. Um, you know, you, if you think, if you close your eyes and you think of, of prisons, you, you think of male prisons, that's just the default. And the numbers support that. But as I said, the number of incarcerated women is staggering. And I do some work in women's prisons, the Frederick Douglass Project. We have partnerships with women's prisons that we're developing. And it is, 
it's a very different, there's less, less of a direct threat of physical violence, um, but there's a lot of sadness. The vast majority of women incarcerated are mothers and they have serious problems of addiction and serious victimization, abuse, usually at the hands of men. And so there's a lot of trauma, a lot of sadness. On the reentry front, the problem remains, which is that most organizations that do reentry are for men. There are some that are specifically for women, but the vast majority are for men, or they don't even say they're for men, but they just are for men. And so it's a it's a serious challenge um, for the, the high numbers because it the, the percentage makes it sound small, but the absolute numbers are so high. And so, you know, we need to do a much better job in supporting women coming home from incarceration. Mark, Thank you so be... much for today and, and for all your work. Sure. It's phenomenal. Thank you. I want to respect your time, but the, we have a couple more questions. I don't know sure. if you have I'm time. I'm okay. I can go okay. a little over. Nina? Hi. Uh, you and I share an alma mater as far as the Law Center goes. And, oh, nice. um, I was just wondering if you had um, any plans to involve any of the current uh, law students there, either through clinics or otherwise in your exoneration work or in reduction of sentencing? Yeah, thank you, Nina. That's a live uh, question where I'm trying to create that. It's it's complicated. I could give you a longer answer offline, but um, my main appointment is at on the main campus at Georgetown. As you know, the law center is across town. It's hard to get back and forth. It's hard to have a real presence in both places. And I've really kept my presence on the main campus. And so the work that I've been doing on wrongful convictions is with undergraduates. That said, I've had some uh, law students who've been interns, and I'm trying to think about a way to develop a clinic that will be effective and that will be self-sustaining and that won't just add even more work. Um, I sleep, you know, three, four hours a night. And to say, like, start a new program in a new place without the full you know, support and resources to do it would be, I think, foolish, but I want to do it. And I'm trying to think, actively trying to think of ways to at least involve um, law students in the law center more directly. So thank you for, for pushing it again to the forefront of my mind with your question. Thank you. Uh, Mark, so I just, again, want to respect your time. So if you are an attendee on this call and you're feeling called to get involved in this work, what is the, what would be you know, three possible next steps for yeah. community parishioners? Well, I would say for sure, join our mailing list. Uh, maybe Ashley, you could even put that into the chat or send it to people afterwards, um, both the Prisons and Justice Initiative and the Frederick Douglass Project. So that way you can stay abreast of our activities. We, um, as I said, will soon have opportunities to visit at the DC jail through the Douglas Project and um, also to join a virtual visit. Um, so that, that's the most direct way to stay up on, on the programs that I'm involved in and running. Um, and then I think, you know, generally is to, to follow this issue. Cause I think that, you know, we're, we're bombarded with news and information, but there really is a lot these days that if you are, are sensitive to it, and if you look at it through the lens, hopefully some of the facts and information I gave you will, will stick with you um, to kind of cut through the noise and see it really from a human perspective that, you know, each and every person is a human being. Each and every person has people who love them and who care about them. Um, I go to prisons all around the country. I visit prisons. When, when I go for travel, whether it's work travel or personal travel, I always try to go visit a prison. I try to go talk to people and connect with people. And every single place, I find people who are, who are extraordinary and who are paying a steep price for mistakes they made that they deeply regret and who are trying to atone, who are trying to find redemption. and I try to support them. And, and one of the things I bring them is, is hope and, and telling them that there's a society out there that actually does care about them. They may not have cared 10 or 20 years ago, but I think there's been a change. I think there's also a generational change that's taking place. I see it in my students. They are so energized and activated. My, my course, Prisons and Punishment, fills up with an apparently like 10 seconds of live registration. It's like a mad grab. Um, and uh, has you know, huge waiting lists. And there's just this desire by students to engage on these issues and connect with people because it really, it's just, it's about people in the end. And uh, you know, I think about the young man uh, in the Colorado prison who after participating in several of our virtual prison visits said, you know, this is the first time in five years I've talked to anyone outside of prison other than my parents. 
And, you know, for him, he might as well have been on the moon. It's so separate from society. Um, there's another, another uh, gentleman who um, had given up the parental rights to his children because he's facing 20 years in prison and he didn't want to be a hindrance. He loves them, but he didn't want to be a burden to them. He wanted them to be free from him. And through our program, he decided to reconnect with him. And he was in tears telling us how they said, you'll always be our dad. We still love you. And, and, and you know, he's reconnected with them in a new way. And now they talk by phone every week. And it's just, it's so beautiful, you know, and everybody in there, you know, I, I don't ever want to minimize crime and the harm that's caused, but I think that people are capable of more and people, people are capable of redemption and, and love and support. And I feel this overwhelming sense of love for people when I, when I go inside and I meet them and I see them in a way, it's not the person, you know, on the rap sheet or in the courtroom. And, and again, I don't want to minimize those actions, but at the same time, I see potential in people and I want to, my mission is to really get the rest of the world to see that too. Because I think if we do, we will reduce crime, we will get better outcomes, we'll have a much better society that we can be proud of. Well, it's easy to see why there's a wait list for your class. <laughs> You're <laughs> amazing. So um, thank you again. And we really appreciate your time today. And I personally look forward to finding ways that our community can work with you and um, and really believe in your mission. So again, thanks right. so much, Mark. We'll, well be thank you all so much. Thank you for joining. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thank everybody. You so much. Take care.